when I think of how he came so far from glory came and dwelt among the lowly such as I to suffer shame and such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place then I ask myself this question who am I who am I that a king would bleed and die for who am I that he would pray not my will line for the answer I came to me he came to me when I could not come to where he was he came to me that's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he came to me, sing it with me now, oh what a Savior, oh hallelujah, his heart was broken, his heart was broken on Calvary, his hands were nailed scarred, his side What a blessing. Find in your Bible, please, this morning, Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look in some verses in chapter 5 and some verses in chapter number 6. But before that, I want to give a lucky couple a chance to earn $20. I did it in Sunday school, and I'll do it again. Um, so I need a lucky... Wait, that's not money. There we go. I need a lucky couple to stand up and volunteer. I'm just going to ask you one simple question. One simple question, very simple question, easy, easy question. Anybody, going once, I'm going to keep it for myself. Going twice. Joe and Carolyn Smith volunteered this morning. So, Joe and Carolyn, promise this simple, stand up, please. This is Valentine's Day, you know. You're gonna, you might earn 20 bucks to take her out. That'll buy like just hers. It won't buy both of you, okay. But within $5... Within $5, Miss Carolyn, tell me how much cash Joe has in his wallet right now within $5. He hides me. <laughs> I don't blame him, but... That's not fair. Uh, 20 bucks. Tell me how much he's got within $5. $80. 80 bucks. Joe? <laughs> if you got 80, you don't need this 20, but... Yeah. I have to look. Joe yeah. don't know so much he can't even count it all. <laughs> Man, he's got rubber band around it and everything. Uh oh. Ninety-one. Oh, you were within eleven dollars. That's close. Anybody else? Anybody else? Tell me how much money she has in her wallet, her purse, within five dollars. And you're going to win 20 more. $45. $45. Now, you win 20, 40, 60. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> Man, I asked the wrong people. Brother Roger, Miss Donna, within $5, tell me how much cash Roger has in his wallet right now. He has a $100 bill. 
How much you got, Brother Roger? That's his allowance this week. He has a hundred dollar bill. There you go. You get twenty more. That's awesome. All right, good. Spend it wisely. Spend it wisely. I asked somebody this morning, and the person I asked, uh, the wife, she said she's always got more than the husband has. That's interesting. And I said, you know why? I said, yeah, because when the kids need five bucks for school, they go to mama, you know. They need two bucks for this, five bucks for this, they all go to mama. All right, let's look in our Bible this morning, please. This is Valentine's Day. It's also I Love My Family Sunday. So I want to take time this morning and also time uh, tonight and, and talk about the home. And, and we're going to begin looking at this morning. And let me just give you a, a preamble, I guess is the right word. Nothing I'll say this morning or tonight is new to any of us. God doesn't give any more people special revelation you know God has already told us in his word what works for every area of life and especially in the home uh, I don't have a I don't God didn't tap me on my shoulder and wake me up from a dream and and show me some kind of video on new stuff not at all God told me in his word what he wants to us to know about our homes about our marriages and about our family and then I thought you know well why with all this going on in the world, why in the world take, take time in two services to talk about the family? I mean, there's many other issues. I mean, there's many other things happening in the world. Why take time on a Sunday morning when we could hear, we could preach about grace, we could preach, uh, preach about the blood of Christ, we could preach about all these things, but here's, here's what I want you to see. And this is my opinion, I think, and I think I agree with the Lord. Your marriage... And your family, your home, ought to be the most important thing to you. It's the most important thing to God next to your salvation. There's three things God instituted. The family, the government, and the church. And he did it in that order. Family ought to come first. Family, your, your, your marriage, your family ought to be the most important thing to you outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your home, your family. So today, uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the kind of marriage that our children need. That's interesting, right? You mean our kids need a, a, a marriage? Yes, our kids need to see what a good marriage looks like. Because they're going to see, they're going to see examples all over the world on what a marriage is. And I think it ought to come from you and I who are, who are married, who are in this church, who are in charge of our children. We're going to see many things about that in a little bit. But I also want to bring this thought out to you. Don't we all want our kids to have whatever it takes to be successful I mean we want our kids we want our kids to go to the best school um, and we and we work two three jobs sometimes to provide a an education for our children uh, if it's a you know private education it you know by the way kids private education costs a lot of money to your parents and you ought to be thankful for that and by the way, there's a free school down the street from your house, and a free school bus would come and pick you up and take you to that free school, and you probably could get a free lunch and a free supper. But so those, you, you, you whose parents are spending extra money and working extra jobs, so you can go to a, a private school, you ought to thank God for them, for that. They don't have to do that. They do it because they want what's best for you. Uh, if your kids are into whatever, if your kids are into, I don't know, art, <laughs> or hunting or scouts or swimming or gymnastics or sports whatever it is you're going to make sure that your kids have whatever they need to be successful in that if your kids are into art you're going to make sure they have the best pencils the best uh, markers the best pens the best paper if there's such a thing as art club you're going to want them to be in the art club and go off to art camp and you're going to make sure that they go to the museum and see all the things of art you're going to prepare your children for that it could be their future could be their job or whatever you're going to make sure your kids are prepared for their future if they like scouts if they like hunting if they like fishing if they like uh, uh, sports with us it was always sports our kids uh, were really into sports uh, baseball basketball football soccer rubik's cube that's not really a sport but they're into that 
And so we would make sure they'd have, you know, if they needed a ball glove and needed a soccer ball, need a pair of cleats, or kids made the all-stars, which meant we had to travel to all these tournaments and, and, and buy some silly uniform and some silly bag they're going to use for about two weeks and spend 80 bucks on it because, you know, that what the kids are doing. And you want to make sure your kids have all that they need to be successful in whatever it is, schooling, uh, sports, hobbies, Whatever it is, you're going to make sure that your kids have whatever they need to be successful. I can think of no greater, well, the Apostle John said, I can think of no, no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. But I can think of no greater joy as a parent than to know that in the future my children will have a good marriage. Well, where are they going to find that out from? They're going to find it from God's Word. Look in Ephesians chapter 5, and you know what? It's Valentine's Day. Stay in your seat. Some of you will be going out to lunch after church, and I want you to save your strength. Because <laughs> this line is going to be long. <laughs> oh, my goodness, the line is going to be long. One good thing, though, about corona is now, you know, you go to a restaurant, you say there's a, a party of two, and they say, go to your car and wait, and we'll text you. Isn't that glorious? But anyways... All right, look at Ephesians chapter 5, please. We're going to begin reading. We could begin reading anywhere. We're going to start in verse 22 and go down to verse, uh, chapter 6, verse number 4. Verse 22, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, uh, uh, submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's stop right there. Just a quick time out. Notice both the wife and the husband are an example of Christ. One in how they love and one in how they obey. Look in verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Stop right there. What, Paul, what are you trying to say? Well, he gives us the example order in the verse. And, you know, no man, if the husband, if, if the husband has a need and he can meet the need, he'll take care of that, won't he? If he's sick, he'll, take a, he'll rest. If he, if he needs some medicine, he'll get some medicine. If there's a need he has, he'll, he'll meet that need. So what we also do so to our wives. Because if we love ourselves, we want ourselves to be happy because we love ourselves. So Paul said, so you love your wife like you love yourself. Love your own body. Verse 29. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even, here we go again, even as the Lord, the church. Let me stop again. I got too many stops here. You know, the Lord loves his church. The Bible tells us he died for his church. He gave his life for the church. I, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but I realize here that the Bible is telling we husbands to love our wives that way. To be willing even to give our lives for our wife. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined in his wife. And they shall, two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Look in verse chapter 6, verse 1. You see, is why would Paul continue talking about the marriage and yet bringing the children in? Here's what I want you to see. Here's what the Lord uh, gave me this thought. When the children are doing well, it affects the marriage in a positive way. And when the children aren't doing well, it also affects the marriage. So, so we talked about the marriage, verse 6. It's, it's a continuing thought. Now, there's not like Paul doesn't stop writing and say, okay, next week I'll write some more. No, he's con continuing to write about the marriage in chapter 5, chapter 6. The children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition 
of the Lord. I want to preach on that thought this morning on this Valentine's Day, the marriage that our children need. The marriage that our children need. Let's pray together, please. Our Father, I want to thank you this morning for your wonderful word and how you've given us the blueprint for a home. You've penned the words in your holy inspired Bible on what a marriage and family is supposed to look like. And I pray today, God, that we'd not stray from that. Society has its rules, its ideas about what a, a marriage and a home is. But Lord, we want to focus this morning on what your idea is, on what your advice is, on what your blueprint is. And I pray today, God, especially this morning, for everybody listening within the sound of my voice, whether in this room or on live stream, who are married, that their marriage might honor Jesus Christ. And then I pray for those watching and listening today who are not yet married. I pray today, God, you'd put some thoughts into their mind. When their time comes, they may uh, want this kind of marriage in their life. And I pray for those who divorced, widowed, lost loved ones. God, you'd comfort their heart this morning. They can pray for the rest of us. And God, I pray your will be done. Speak to all of us today. Your word's good for all of us. Encourage us today and challenge us in our homes, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned a little, bit, a little bit ago briefly that our children, they get their idea about what a marriage is from all kind of different places. And it's interesting how uh, almost, every, almost everywhere else in society, they see what a marriage is according to their standards. And they, it's, it's really a joke, really. They could get uh, their idea of what a marriage is by those marriages on TV. Uh, and please don't do that. There are some shows on TV, and, and I've, never, I've never watched these shows, but there's a show on the Learning Channel, and we watch other shows on the Learning Channel, and this commercial comes on, and this show was called 90 Day Fiancé. Now, don't raise your hand if you watched it. I, I don't think you should, but, but 90 Day Fiancé, and here's kind of the, here's the crutch of the show. Okay, you meet somebody for the first time. You've never seen them before for the first time. And, you know, they may be ugly. They may be pretty. Who knows? But you meet them for the first time, and you've got 90 days to figure out if you're going to want to marry this person. So you've got 90 whole days to, to plan to consider the rest of your life. 90 whole days. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. There's a show called Sister Wives. Uh, I, I guess it's um, Mormon people. I, I've never seen it either, but I've seen the commercial. And this guy's got four wives, and they call themselves sister wives. And they, I guess they get along well, and they, they all get to have one thing in common. They all love the same man, and he, he's all their husbands. And, and I guess they take turns going on dates or whatever. I don't know, but that, to me, that, that just makes a mockery of God's plan for marriage. And there's a show, other show called Wife Swap. Again, never seen it. Never seen it. But I'm assuming that these two couples will swap spouses. For what reason? I have no idea um, why in the world. Nobody else could handle me. I wouldn't swap myself with anybody. Nobody else could handle me. Uh, but it's apparently it's a popular show and many people watch it. But again, that, makes a, that is a mockery in the sight of God about what a marriage is. <clears throat> There's a show called The Bachelor. And I know I'm probably stepping on some toes. But again, you've got some beautiful lady and some hunk of a man. And they get to choose from these, I don't know, 10 or so other people. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a week and they'll make out with this person for a week. And then they'll make out with this person for a week. And they'll talk about their hopes and dreams and all the hobbies. And so they'll spend a week making out with somebody. And come the next week, you decide if you want to give them a rose or not. How silly, how crazy is that? Listen, never make out with somebody you're not already married to. Oh my goodness, I better turn to another portion of Scripture. <laughs> I'll say it again. Never make out with somebody you're not already married to. <clears throat> Thank you very much. But these shows make a mockery of marriage. They're, they're turning what God planned and designed to be the most important part of your life 
and they turn it into something to get people to view so you'll watch their commercials. Listen, what a joke it is to think that in 90 days uh, you can meet a complete stranger and decide if they're going to be your spouse for the rest of your life. What a, what a mockery it is to have all these different wives and what a mockery it is to, to swap wives and what a mockery it is to, to choose your wife by who is the best one at making out. It's a mockery. Our children ought to get their idea of what a good marriage is by watching their mom and dad. Let me give you quickly today three thoughts about a marriage that our children need. And we'll notice the assignments within the home. You realize God in His Word, He's told everybody in the family what to do. And he's not like, he's not written it in the sky. He's not hired some airplane pilot to, uh, to pull a banner across the sky and, and to say one thing. No, he's put it again in his, in his, in his inerrant word of God. This Bible is good for all generations. This Bible, listen, 2021 society does not agree much with what this Bible says. This Bible is not politically correct. I'll go ahead and tell you, this Bible is not politically correct. And if you uh, were going to society and you would say, well, the Bible says they'd probably laugh you to scorn about your marriage and what the Bible says. But God in his Bible, in the blueprint of his word, he's told us what, is, what makes a good marriage. What is the assignment? He's given the wife, the husband, and the children an assignment in the home. What is that assignment? Well, there's the first word is the word, uh, is the word headship. Somebody's got to be in charge. And God has just said again in his word that it's to be the husband. And I know it's not politically correct and it may not sell any books nowadays, but God told us in his word, look at the Bible in verse 23, uh, for the husband is head of the wife even as Christ is head of the church and is savior of the body. I think, it's just my humble opinion and I'm just a preacher, I don't really know. I'm thinking that's really a, that's really a curse on many homes, the idea that dad won't take charge of the home. Uh, again, that's a mockery to a holy God. When a dad, a father, a husband will not take a head of his home, he ought to be in charge. Uh, it don't matter who's smarter. <laughs> Goodness, that's not the case in our home. It don't matter who's smarter. It don't matter who's been saved longer. It don't matter who makes more money. It don't matter who's better looking. It don't matter who's got whatever, what the Bible says in God's blueprint for our home, for our marriage, that his design is, his assignment for the husband is to be the head of the home. Don't shoot from the hip. Don't do life your own way. Do what the Bible says. I've been, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was painting out at um, Woodward Academy. And Woodward Academy is uh, they're remodeling. They have a 27,000 square foot remodeling job and that's just phase one. And so I get to, I get to, to paint it. And uh, the, the foreman came to me and he says, let's go look at the blueprints. And he, we went in the side room where this table was and there was a stack of blueprints like that thick. And I thought, it's just painting. It's not that big of a deal. You cut it in and you roll it and you, and you call it a day. No, it's no, there's blueprints. And on this blueprint, they literally would show, of course, where all the, the, all the lights go, all the plugs go, with the plumbing, and all the... And it showed which rooms get to be which color. Interesting. I mean, just tell me. I don't need a blueprint. Just tell me, you know. But what, what if I, as the painter, what if I said, well, I know the blueprint. I know the blueprint says this room is to be blue, and this room is to be red, and this room is to be yellow, and this room is to be green. What if I say, you know what, I'll just paint this room whatever I want it to be because I know best. I'm the painter. You think, well, that's silly, preacher. That is the silliest thing I ever heard of, you not following the blueprint. Sila. It's silly for you and I to think there's another way to have a marriage that honors God outside of his blueprint. There's a headship. Somebody's got to be in charge. There's also the second word is hardship. Hardship. It probably isn't a real word, but it starts with an H. And I needed an H. Look in verse 22 and verse 24. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands and unto the Lord. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto, the, unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands 
in everything. And again, this is the year 2021, and those that don't agree with us may laugh me to scorn what the Bible says. If somebody is the head of the home, then other folks have to follow their lead. And in this case, Ephesians 5, he's talking about a home where there is a husband and there is a wife and there are children. The husband is to be in charge and then the wife and then the children. Well, what if there's no husband? Well, duh, then it's the mom. Simple. Simple. You know, God's word is so simple. If we just let it be, (laughs) we confuse it and we... And we try to add our own stuff to it, and, and we try to, you know, make it make sense, and we try to, you know, modernize it. Just, just obey the Bible. <clears throat> I've heard of some ladies that are so against this that they would rather obey their boss than their husband. <laughs> Again, that's a mockery to the husbands. This just, thank you, Lord, for this thought. It's a whole lot easier for our wives to do their responsibility if we're making sure we're doing our responsibility. Remember what Paul said, husbands love your wife. And it's got to be easier for a lady to obey her husband if he's a nice guy, if he's not a tyrant, if he's not a dictator, if he's not ruling his house with an iron fist. It must be much easier for her to submit to you if you're doing right. And then uh, wives, it must be easier for a husband to love her if she's doing what she's supposed to do. Then notice the third H is the word honor. Headship, hardship, and then the word honor. Look in verse 6. Kids, you're not left out. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be, here's the promise, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Children got to realize they have a responsibility as well. Their job is not to be the head or the heart. Their job is to honor. The children's job, even in the year 2021, where we're taught to exalt the children and lift the children up and and give the children all the authority and whatever the children want, oh, that's what mom and dad's going to do. That's hogwash. It's not in the Bible. Our children are told to honor their mom and their dad. And did you notice that only the children have a promise? Paul says to the husband, love your wives. That's it. Love your wives. No promise, no, if you do, then this. And Paul tells the wives, honor your husband, respect your husband. No promise, no, you do this and then I'll do that. But to the children, God says, children, honor your mom and dad, obey your parents, then uh, you'll have a better life. There probably aren't too many children in juvenile homes and probably not too many people in jail as a young adult who they're there because they always obey their mom and dad. In fact, it's probably the opposite. you don't believe me, believe a man named Samson. You've heard of him in the Bible. You've heard his story. Samson and Delilah. Oh, he was just duped by this beautiful lady. He was just duped. He saw her, and I mean, he had to have her. And uh, he, I mean, he was, she was, woo-wee, I want some of her. And, and you think, it's, no, what, what got Samson off the, off the wrong path is he didn't listen to his mom and his dad. Before he met Delilah, he disobeyed mom and dad. Before he touched the dead lion and the honey, uh, and uh, he, he, he disobeyed mom and dad. Before he got off the wrong course, he did not listen to his mom and his dad. Before he was, got his eyes poked out, before he was uh, killed under the, under the porch of the Philistine house, before all of that, he disobeyed his mom and dad. By the way, your parents, they don't have to be cool. Believe me, I try, and I'm just not cool anymore. I used to be cool before I had kids. We as parents, we don't have to make sense. We don't have to be concerned with our children's feelings. We don't have to uh, stroke our kids and give them self-confidence. We don't have to be their friend. Hello? We don't have to give our kids everything that they want. 
We don't have to let our kids do all that they want to do. Our job is to set the rule and set the boundaries and enforce those rules. And our children's job is to obey them and honor them and sit back and watch God bless their life. So there's some assignments in the home. Number two, uh, listen quickly, please. Number two, notice the affection within the home. This is Valentine's Day, and so there ought to be some affection at least today in your home. At least two days a year, Valentine's Day and your anniversary. In his book called Meditations for Ministry, my, my good friend Kenny Kuykendall, he said this. He said, I wonder how many homes in the United States are void of biblical charity. Of course, that means love. We have strife, division, stress, tension, walls, miscommunication, and dysfunction galore. Most of our issues could and would be settled if we understood and implemented the command to love one another. Sadly, in many Christian homes, the parents are no longer passionate soulmates. They are just pitiful roommates. Affection. Affection. How sad it must be. And I just sort of kind of made a mockery just a minute ago about, you know, only Valentine's Day and the anniversary. But how sad it must be when we allow our affection to be only be seen twice a year. There was a song written in 1964 by the Righteous Brothers. And the song was called, You've Lost That Loving Feeling. You ever heard it? You know, that loving feeling. Anyways, I'm not going to sing it. I want to read the words to you. We're talking about affection in the home. Here's how the song goes. You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. And there's no tenderness like before in your fingertips. You're trying hard not to show it, but baby, baby, I know it. You've lost that loving feeling. Whoa, that loving feeling. You've lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Verse 2. Now there's no welcome look in your eyes when I reach for you. And girl, you're starting to criticize little things I do. It makes me just feel like crying, baby, because baby, something's beautiful is dying. You've lost that loving feeling. Whoa, that loving feeling. You've lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Verse 3. Baby, baby, I'd get down on my knees for you. If you would only love me like you used to do, we had a love, a love, a love you don't find every day. So don't, 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 don't let it slip away. So baby, baby, please, please, I need your love, need your love, I need your love, I need your love. So bring it back, bring it back. Bring back that loving feeling. Whoa, that loving feeling. Bring back that loving feeling because it's gone, gone, gone. Now that's just a song written in 1964, so about 45 years or more, 50 years or so ago. Just a song, and I, I, I guess on the radio it played, and there probably were some guys or some girls who, when that song came on the radio, they thought, oh, this describes my boyfriend. But it also describes probably many Christian marriages. You know why? Because life gets so busy. Life gets so busy with work and with kids at school and with church and society and all the things that, that are taking time out of our life. And it's very simple to, uh, to lose that loving feeling. So it's no wonder Paul, remember, under the inspiration of God, wrote to the husband and said to the husband, no matter how busy you are, no matter how things have changed, and, and no matter what's going on in your schedule, and no matter about your work life and your recreation life, and no matter what's happening, you. Uh, husband love your wife there's no ending you don't say love your wife until fill in the blank no love your wife forever when your kids or your grandkids when they see grandma and grandpa or mom and dad loving each other and they say something like this that's gross you're doing a good job when your kids say, get a room, you're doing a good job. 
Let me ask you a question. What would be better for your kids to say, Mom and Dad, why are you always fussing? Or get a room. Affection in the home. By the way, our kids know it. They're smarter than what we give them credit for. You can con a con. You can fool a fool. But you can't kid a kid. If your marriage is on the rocks, take those rocks, don't throw them at each other, throw them down, and get right with the Lord. There's a defection in the home. And finally, as we close up, there's an assignment in the home, there's an affection within the home, and finally, number three, there's abilities within the home. Abilities within the home. I want to use the word again, and the word is blueprint. Right here in your Bible, Ephesians 5 and 6, right here in your Bible. This is the blueprint for your marriage. God's told us what to do. Well, how can my marriage honor God? It's in the Bible. How can I raise my children? How as a child, how can I honor my mom and dad? How can we make our family and our home honor God? It's right here in the blueprint. Don't, st don't stray from the blueprint. Husbands, love your wife. Husbands, lead your home. Uh, uh, wives, obey your husband. Respect your husband. And children, honor your mom and your dad. And you all have that ability. You all can do that. God never tells you to do something that you cannot do. That's not what God does. God doesn't give us an assignment that's impossible. God doesn't give us a job to do, and God doesn't tell us what to do and then make it impossible to do. With God, all things are possible. It's possible for you as a husband to be the head of your home and to love your wife. It's possible for you as a wife to honor your husband and obey your husband. And it's very possible, it's very, uh, you, you can do this, children. You can honor your mom and your dad. It's Valentine's Day, and I'm closing and I don't know, maybe you've not yet gotten your, uh, your, your wife or your, your significant other a valentine, but I want to share some things with you. And this is some, some uh, tongue-in-cheek and some not. This article is called 10 Things Every Man Should Give His Wife on Valentine's Day and Every Day. Studies show that most men purchase gifts for their wives either the day before or the day of Valentine's Day. Honestly, how many men do you think bought Valentine gifts last month? And I hate to remind you, Valentine's Day is today. That's what the article says, okay? If you pre-planned, good for you. Please pray for the rest of us. If you have not prepared, I do have some good news for you. There's a few things your wife wants that cannot be supplied by Walmart or Kohl's or CVS. There are some things that should be given every day of the year, not just Valentine's. Warning, this is a pretty good list, but you'll still need to get your wife a real gift, probably more expensive than the one you got her last year. Okay, first of all, number one, this is, this is good, okay? First thing you give your wife on Valentine's Day is a good relationship with God. You know, you talk about what, what makes a, a woman... Fall in love with a man? What makes her, when she sees her husband, just get all those, you know, those googly eyes or whatever? A.W. Tozer said, the best way for a husband to save his family from delinquency is to show them an example of a man who loves God uncompromisingly. Your relationship with God is the most important thing you can give your wife. Guard it, grow it, and give it to her. Number two. What can you give your wife on Valentine's Day and every day? A fatherly presence to her children. In the book uh, uh, called King Me, Steve Farrer wrote, uh, he says, uh, God has called you to be a father, not a jerk. Every wife wants her husband to be the spiritual role model for her children. Encourage her by giving her and her children a biblical pattern for manhood. God, bring back the days when a man was a man. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Steve, Brother Roger. Number three, compliment her about her appearance. This seems to fade away over time. The flirtatious compliments from the youthful honeymoon days have a way of being replaced with groaning and complaining about all of your physical ailments. 
Let her know she's attractive. Let her know you still, she's still the apple of your eye. Number four, uninterrupted time and affection. The guy who wrote the article says this. Let's admit it, this one's hard. Have you ever had a conversation with your spouse while watching ESPN or scrolling through Facebook? Just to let you know, she hates it. She hates it because she knows your attention is elsewhere. So put down the iPad, turn off the TV, and disregard the voicemail she gave your children and makes your house a home. Give her some well-deserved attention. And the article says, all the ladies said, amen. Thank you very much, both of you. Number five, a sense of security. And again, this is 2020, 2021, but it's still good. Whether they want to admit it or not, women like security. They want to know that everything's going to be okay, regardless of the issue, finances, emotions, relationship, etc. Let them know that you're leading her and that you have a plan. Security. Number six. This one's tough to swallow. Number six. Help around the home. The guy writing the article says this. My wife secretly found this article and added this one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Housework is relentless and ongoing. Uh, since my surgery, this guy says, I have been around the house a lot more than normal. I've seen firsthand the mounds of laundry, the piles of dishes, and the ongoing list of chores. If you really want to get her in a good Valentine's Day mood, forget the cheap smelling cologne. Why not try vacuuming the living room? That sound you hear is the hand clapping of every woman in the world. <laughs> Number seven, what can you give your wife? How about a good attitude? How often do we complain to each other? More than we probably realize. A good attitude is infectious. Stop griping and fussing about everything and everyone. A critical spirit breeds hostility and negativity. It's hard to kiss somebody whose lips taste like vinegar. Number eight. Memories that will last. Create a moment. Tell, uh, take her to that special restaurant. Do something out of the ordinary. Don't go through the drive through at Zaxby's and expect her to be thrilled. Be creative, be spontaneous, be considerate. Give her a memory that will last in the photo album of her mind for years to come. Number nine, meaningful conversation about life. Some of the most cherished moments of life are those simple settings that me and my wife discuss when we've been and where we're going. Put aside the pointless and silly nonsense and reconnect. You may already know everything about each other, but confirm that notion with a meaningful conversation. Number 10, and we're done. What can you give your wife on Valentine's Day and every day? A gift. You're not off the hook just because today is Sunday. And the article, he wrote this. Let me clearly state, items 1 through 9 will mean nothing if you don't get her a gift. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about marriage. We've had some fun. We've laughed, we've joked, we've cut up. We've also looked in God's Word. And what God's Word says about everything is true. God doesn't change the rules to meet modern society. God doesn't change the rules because it's not politically correct. And God doesn't re redo the blueprint to make sure it meets up with society's expectations. No, what God says is forever settled in heaven. So can I ask you, as you bow your head, as you close your eyes, can I ask you this question? How's your marriage? How is your marriage? When your children, when they think about what a marriage looks like, and they think about, well, all I see is my mom and dad, and that's what I want in my marriage. If that's wonderful, if that's true, that's wonderful. Praise God for that. Because they're going to get an idea of what marriage is somewhere. TV, from their friends, who's all their friends' parents' marriages is in shambles. They're going to even think, well, what my friend's mom and dad has is good, or what uh, uh, the TV show has is good, or, or what my mom and dad has is good. So their heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe this morning you need to make your way to the altar and pray and say, God, help me be the husband I'm supposed to be. Or God help me be the wife I'm supposed to be. 
Or God help me as a young person be the obedient child I'm supposed to be. And I can promise you this, God's going to bless it. God's going to bless it.